Uh, so we're here, as David said, to, to listen. We want your input. This is a draft master plan. That's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is that it is a master plan. We will get into detailed design next as we get into the design of the phases of the park. So at this point, we're just trying to get the general concept right. So keep that in mind. You know, We haven't yet designed the benches, for instance. OK. So uh, this is our agenda for tonight. Uh, it is a synthesis of input we have received, as Kim mentioned now, from all kinds of venues, in including these uh, public meetings. Uh, we're we're uh, here, January 24th, our third public meeting. We'll be wrapping up in April, the, the master plan phase. And I think it's important to always come back to the public survey. Kim mentioned the phenomenal numbers of responses we got. It's true. Uh, really pretty spectacular. Uh, we asked for feedback within these four categories of uses in the park. And we asked you and people online to tell us what their desires were for program elements within these categories. And so you see here the top six within each of those four categories. Uh, a lot of this is not surprising. Uh, a lot of this is, uh, you know, pretty expected for a park of this size and a city of this sort and size. A, a few things that were very interesting to us that were maybe slightly unusual was the number of responses we got uh, relative to nature trails, sustainability, uh, give us a sort of landscape rich park that is a respite from the urban environment. We thought that was pretty terrific and maybe shows the need for such a park within the city and really works with the fact that we have 70 acres, which is pretty unusual for a downtown park. Um, we, we heard things like public art. We heard things about interpretation and recreation. So we heard lots of good feedback that has been a part of this design process. We sh last time we were here, we showed you three approaches to the, the design of the park. And those approaches differed in the way program or uses and activities were distributed throughout the park. So in the first approach, we had uh, a lot more program at the north end of the park. And it became very natural as you came to the lower park. So upper park very active, lower park not as active. And in fact, you'll see that, that the promenade in the lower park was a meandering kind of promenade. And people said, you know, maybe that's not a direct connection enough to the river. But people really liked the oval lawn, the event lawn, and liked the fact that it was an O, or that it was an oval, and very identifiable as a place. Uh, people liked the lake, but thought that perhaps it was a little small in this case, but maybe not quite usable enough for recreation. People like the way the uh, park addressed the boulevard with both a landscape character and a plaza character. The second approach, people liked uh, very much the way the promenade connection to the river in the lower park was a more direct connection. Um, people like the distribution of program and activities throughout the upper and lower park, but they were a little concerned with the size of the lake maybe being too big in this one, maybe taking up too much of the park. Uh, people were also concerned that perhaps the plaza was too big along the boulevard, too much hardscape addressing the boulevard, and they missed the O, the oval lawn. So then this third approach, well, people were like, no, no, we want a lake. We want the recreational opportunities that a lake will bring. We want the oval lawn. But in the lower park, people liked the way this approach had spurs or branches, if you will, from the promenade that connected very nicely to the adjacent streets and the adjacent neighborhoods. So it had a sense of connectivity to the perimeter that people liked. And those are, those are summaries, but that's, that's sort of a, a general outline of the things that we heard uh, through our various uh, input sessions. So here we are with a draft plan that synthesizes that input. And uh, this is what we'd like to present this evening and hear your response to. There is a 100% corner. All of those schemes, I should have mentioned that first off, all of the schemes address what we call the 100% corner in a very active way. And that 100% corner is where the boulevard and Robinson intersect. This is where Chesapeake Arena's new plaza will be and new entry is facing. Uh, and it's certainly an opportunity for the convention center site to address that corner as well, possibly even the streetcar alignment. There's a lot of good things. It's close to downtown. 
it's, it, it relates, to, it, you know, reaches toward Bricktown. Uh, and then Robinson is a street that connects, uh, obviously, down to the river. So that corner is a very important corner. That's where we see a big plaza, urban gardens, a big interactive fountain, something that's spectacular, that draws you into the park, that says, welcome, and this is the entrance to the park. And then directly behind that, the stage for the event lawn, and the event lawn and the promontory hill, which will be 25 feet high, giving you views um, to the skyline. A cafe, and Hans will talk about that a little bit later in terms of the design of the cafe, but a cafe along the boulevard. Uh, shade, lots of shade. Uh, woodland landscape along the boulevard as well, and an adult play area. So imagine things like bocce, a place to sit in the shade, a place to read, maybe equipment that's like play equipment, but for um, adults, an aging population perhaps. So um, uh, lots of things to do. And then as you move south, the lake, big enough for paddle boats, for small, uh, for small boats, a bridge over it, so you get that experience of crossing over water. Uh, just north of the lake, a children's play area, climbing wall, spray ground, restrooms, things that you need next to a children's play area. And then to the south of the lake, a small plaza where you would uh, rent boats and where other kinds of uh, concessions uh, and uh, amusement facilities could be. And then all along Robinson, gardens, uh, shade, places to sit, activities, um, a real active uh, Robinson as well. Union Station, very much a jewel. We hope to see eventually become very much a jewel in the park, restored and reactivated in uses that can relate to the park. What a great place to have a reception and have your pictures taken of that beautiful building uh, next to this lake. Then a connection to Skydance Bridge, very important connection to Skydance Bridge. And then that, that direct connection to the river, the promenade arcing down to the river, past uh, meadow gardens, prairie gardens, wetland gardens. And then what we call the panhandle, which uh, stretches along the edge of I-40, being a discovery walk, uh, a place for uh, to discover nature and experience uh, the, the, the beautiful woodlands. And, and ball fields, um, or at least open fields, upon which one could play soccer or throw a ball or play frisbee and other recreational facilities, court sports, uh, again, restrooms, maybe some concessions. So the lower park has program. And that particular program uh, at the west end of the, thank you, Jacob, here, uh, imagine that and its proximity to uh, the Latino uh, Community Development Agency and the Little Flower Church, a great synergy there of recreation adjacent to those uses. And then again, uh, activities adjacent to Manual Press Park so that a gazebo, uh, a play field, a plaza could support and enhance that, uh, that connection to this uh, park that recognizes a great American hero that was born here. Um, so uh, th this gives you a sense of program, the diagram that says red for activities, blue for water ideas, uh, green for landscape. The middle is then the plan without the trees, and the far right is the plan with the trees. We like to show you the plan without the trees so you can see what's happening on the ground. Now, the landscape I mentioned earlier is a very important part of how we make this park be about Oklahoma, specific, unique not like parks anywhere else. And the landscape is one of the ways we can, we can do that. It's big enough to create a landscape environment that will mat mature over time and become a really uh, spectacular place that will showcase native Oklahoma trees and understory and a, and a woodland environment as well, well as prairie environments as well as wetland environments. There will be areas of planted lawn for heavy use and play but that will not be the majority of the park because we're conscious of water usage as well as wanting to create something authentic and, uh, and, and different. The dark, I, I want to note the, the dark green woodland gardens. These are sort of islands within the park where it would be very lush landscape. And you would have those as discover, places to discover as you meander through the park. So this is an aerial perspective, an aerial view looking from downtown toward the river, and you see the I-40 corridor and Skydance Bridge in the middle. So hopefully from this view, you get a sense of the activity along the boulevard. Uh, again, the 100% corner, 
the, the notion we're showing of a big plaza, a place for gatherings, a big interactive fountain, something that's lit and beautiful, then the boulevard gardens, and the cafe in the boulevard gardens addressing the boulevard, a, a cafe that's as much about shade as it is about interior space, a very indoor-outdoor space. Uh, and related to that, the stage and the covering over the stage and the various uh, sorts of facilities that one needs to host these big events in a place like that. The lawn, the great lawn, the promontory at the back of the great lawn, and then the pink oval plaza that I referred to earlier as the adult play area, a place for grown-ups, kids as well, but also a place um, for grown-ups, and, and the woodland. And then as you move back, as you move south, uh, the children's play area, Robinson Gardens, the uh, pond, the lake, boats on the lake, the bridge, uh, the, the boat dock area where you can rent your boats, and then Union Station. And all the sort of spectacular foreground to Union Station. And the ramp up to Skydance Bridge, the promenade that just sweeps through the park and ramps graciously and beautifully and easily right up onto Skydance Sky Bridge. And then continuing through the lower park and uh, the various uh, recreation facilities as well as landscape moments uh, throughout the lower park and then all the way to the river. So just taking a, a, a little, just highlighting those a little bit quickly, we'll go through each of those uh, areas and show you a little more detail. So at that 100% corner, the cafe, the boulevard gardens, the plaza, the fountain, the stage, the great lawn, and the promontory. Notice the scale of the great lawn. Those two white rectangles are, are soccer fields. Not that we're building soccer fields, but it just goes to show you could have a couple of pickup games of soccer there easily. So it's a very multi-use, very multi-purpose great lawn. And these images give you a sense of the kinds of things we're talking about. These are not specific proposals so much as precedents to uh, help you imagine what we're talking about. Gardens, fountains, big, big fountains that, a big fountain that just really announces this entrance to downtown and to the park. The kinds of landscapes we're talking about. These gardens would be showy and colorful um, and uh, not necessarily all native. Uh, some of the plants would be about in uh, color display in these boulevard gardens at the north end. So this is a view. Uh, Jacob can point out the, uh, the, the, the key in the upper right-hand corner. Imagine you're standing at that point and looking out, and that's the view shed of the view. So you're at the 100% corner. You've walked into the plaza. You see this fountain. You see the gardens. You see the shade structure. Uh, at the stage, and over on the right, you see the shade structure that's part of the cafe. You see the promontory beyond, and then you see Union Station even beyond that. So it's important that we keep, that while we make a lush landscape that's very shady, and it, but it, it also needs to feel very open and inviting, so that it feels safe and secure and draws you in. Uh, this gives you a sense of the sort of scale of the promontory. And the, the section shows the, all across the Great Lawn how big it is relative to the promontory and the stage. And to even more compare to scale to something you know well, we've taken the Great Lawn and plopped it down on Myriad Gardens uh, to show the difference in scale between this Great Lawn and the Grand Lawn at Myriad Gardens. Just to point out the fact that this will, it, this will sponsor a very different level of use and very different type of use. So they complement each other. That's really the point. A certain kind of thing can be happening in myriad gardens and a very different kind of thing happening here. And people can enjoy both and go back and forth. Very different kinds of uh, crowds can come to events here than can fit in myriad gardens. And it gives you this kind of prospect. Imagine you're up on that promontory, you're looking across the Great Lawn, and because you're slightly south of the skyline, you're looking at the skyline as a backdrop to this fantastic uh, park. You're not sort of under it, you're, you're able to have a, have a view of it. And you can see this is a couple hundred people, and you can see how this Great Lawn can easily take t over 10,000 people um, at, at larger events. Uh, Hans, you want to talk a little bit about the architecture and the idea of it? Do you have a mic? There you go. 
We're working, we, as you all know, I think by this time we have a, we have a big uh, team of, uh, that works with us on this. We don't do this alone. A lot of local partners. But Sir Gardner is one of our main local partners. Yes, thank you, Mary Margaret. Um, the uh, park architecture, very much like the uh, proposed landscape material of the proposed design, takes its inspiration as well from Oklahoma, the history of Oklahoma, the Oklahoma landscape, and traditions of Oklahoma architecture. We were particularly inspired by an 1889 issue of Harper's Weekly. And in that excerpt that we came across, we found a beautiful description of uh, these uh, campfire sites dotted across the Oklahoma horizon at night in those first days of the land run. And we thought it was a beautiful image that suggested the idea that these campfires created a place of safety, of harbor, that helped anchor people in this landscape. And similarly, we started to look at uh, 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 Native American architecture, the geography, and other uh, early historical uh, Oklahoma homestead sites, looking for sources of inspiration. And so with these, you know, we continue to look at other examples of uh, uh, shelters, park structures, landscape structures that have a certain glowing quality, much like these campfires of that uh, early uh, land run time period. But the big, big idea here is that, you know, as you look at other examples of successful cafes and pavilions, uh, both in the United States and throughout the world, that we develop an architecture that, whether it's a cafe, a stage, a shade structure and other uh, park service structures throughout the park, that they have the similar quality, a diaphanous quality, perhaps it's wood, perhaps it's steel lattice, all of which would uh, help orient people throughout the park. But certainly at night, uh, they become these beautiful glowing lanterns that help people find their way throughout and create a beautiful image of this uh, Oklahoma landscape. I like to think of them as, imagine a hearth. Imagine the warmth of the fireplace and the hearth uh, and expressing that in these buildings. So then uh, moving, continuing to the rest of the upper park, uh, the woodland landscape and embraced within that woodland landscape, children's play, the, 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 the lake, the, the boat dock and concessions associated with that and, and Union Station. So if you're standing on that promontory where we were looking toward downtown, just you turn south and you face Skydance Bridge and Union Station, and you look across the lake, and you get this very different prospect. And that's what's one of the things that's so great about having 70 acres. You can, you can create uh, a variety of types of places and experiences, and that will bring people back again and again. Something for everyone. So people on boats, wetland edges to the ponds, beautiful big trees, ground, a climbing wall, and this is where in the children's play area we can begin to get even more specific to an Oklahoman heritage where it can be themed uh, in certain ways. We don't know exactly how yet, but that will be something we'll get into as we get into design. And then Union, Sta uh, Union Station and the, and the great uh, possibilities there uh, of potentially making that building be, uh, have uses that relate to the park. It's big, and there's a lot of space in it, and there are a lot of issues, uh, none, not all of which are resolved, but it's an opportunity that we want to uh, make sure is not lost. So plant types, the Oklahoma woodlands, the ground cover below being, for the most part, a low ground cover. Again, not all grass in the park. And then these, wet, these uh, woodland gardens where there's a little more height, but you're still seeing over them, you're still seeing across, but, but more lushness, more richness to the landscape. So as you enter from the other north corner, the north uh, west corner, thank you, uh, at Hudson and the Boulevard, you have a very different experience entering the park. You're entering the park in a kind of natural setting. You still see that great lawn and the promontory illuminated in, by sunlight because that's the clearing in the woodlands. So it brings you in, but you enter through this shady environment. And along Robinson, gardens, but maybe more about native grasses, more natural landscapes, not as intensive in terms of color or maintenance as the gardens along the boulevard. 
And these are some of the trees along Robinson and some of the plants, that idea of those grasses along Robinson. This is the model, which hopefully some of you saw as you came in, and feel free to look at it as you go out, that pulls it all together. And so we move to the lower park. Um, and the idea of what we call the panhandle that stretches along southwest 10th, that being a sort of meandering discovery walk, a place to get, to get sort of lost, not totally lost, you'll still see the edges, but to feel like you're lost in another world. Uh, and then you end up in a recreational facility where there's court sports and fields and that relationship to the adjacent uh, Latino Community <coughs> Development Agency and Little Flower Church. Then moving down the promenade, you, you encounter another field for play. You encounter prairie gardens. Then as you get closer to the river, you encounter wetland gardens and the plaza and gazebo that will connect to Manuel Perez Park um, to really leverage that adjacency and the possibilities of uh, use, use that can uh, be coordinated. And then finally you reach the, the river and uh, another field at the river's edge and, uh, and connecting to that linear system of trails along the river. So you see examples here of play and courts and the types of landscapes we're talking about. And a view from that lower park looking north. So you see Devon Tower, you see Skydance Bridge, and you see picnicking and, and more passive uses. Uh, you see on the left of this image the promenade, and uh, we'll come back to that. But these are the kinds of landscape, uh, landscape types we're talking about down there. And this is a landscape that will evolve over time. Because when we first plant those trees, they won't be creating enough shade that some of these plants will need ultimately. So it will be a successionary landscape and one that will sort of naturally evolve as the shade gets more and more dense. Some of the uses that can happen in the gazebo adjacent and plaza adjacent to Manuel Perez Park. Circulation and parking important considerations. Uh, the blue that you see on the boulevard and the Robinson is the idea of fast moving bikes. bikes. Bicyclists who want to move you know, rapidly from place to place. On the boulevard that would be in lanes that are part of the street. On Robinson we think that would probably be in, a, in lanes that are separate from the street but at the edge of the park. Then within the park the main promenade the green line would be a place for pedestrians and slow moving bicyclists. So children on small bicycles, people maybe on the spokies that they've rented downtown or that they've picked up, but uh, you know, coexisting wide enough for pedestrians and uh, cyclists to coexist, maybe roller skaters as well, uh, baby buggies, etc. And then the little dashed uh, red trails would be pedestrian only so that you have a kind of hierarchy of types of uh, movement within the park. And as you can see from the links, you can choose your, your, your length of run if you're a runner and you want to run through the park. Uh, Spokies, bike, bike rentals in probably three locations make sense. Up near the uh, cafe, maybe associated with Union Station, helping make Union Station continue to be about the future of transportation. Uh, and then maybe adjacent to Manual Press Park, closer to the river, so that you can then get onto that river trail system from there. So this is, an, this is a view looking south on the promenade. So you get that sense of the width of the promenade, the fact that it would be specially and beautifully paved, uh, custom benches maybe that sort of sponsor a different, different types of uses, sitting, maybe lounging. Um, the lights, these fabulous lighting elements that would be sort of iconic lighting elements that could progress all the way from the boulevard to the river. And they would be elements that would refract and catch light in the day and then cast light in the night. They could have color to them, but they would be very iconic, very beautiful art pieces uh, within, within the park. And we're working with an artist on on the proposal to uh, figure out exactly how this could work and testing the idea. But it would be a, a, a sort of thread that one could follow and um, perhaps even could make its way along the convention center site to Marriott Gardens, who knows. Uh, in terms of parking, we talked about this last time, but the idea of parallel parking on Robinson and on Hudson Southwest 10th and Harvey perpendicular parking. And this actually creates a good edge to a park. It creates a sort of buffer to a park that works well in parks and gives us a lot of parking, actually, for day-to-day -day use of the park. 
So you see this cross-section along uh, Hudson and Harvey and that idea of tailgating. You can back in if you want to and unload your ice chest and your, your blankets and your kids and your dog and stay for the afternoon. Sustainability, it was a high priority amongst the public feedback we got. We'll look at obviously preserving every existing tree we can. Uh, there's not lots of really healthy big trees in the park, but there are some, and we will definitely work with those. Uh, Stormwater management is a very important part, and we have some more displays to talk about stormwater management. But energy, uh, alternative energy resources, sources for alternative energy. So we're looking at all those aspects. This diagram is showing you the idea of some of those, um, both wind power and a collection of stormwater, rainwater on the site, and using that to fill the lake and using it for irrigation. Oklahoma City is a city about energy. And we think it should be about the future of energy as well. So it's a great story to tell. Now, part of our charge is to not only think about how we build this beautiful park uh, and what's in it, but how it has a life for generations to come. And it, it's important to think about operations and maintenance and programming and security, what that will cost, how that will be done, and how it will be funded. So uh, this is a chart that shows the idea. We're working, working with HRNA economic advisors. Andrea Wong is here with us tonight. So if you have any questions afterwards, you can ask Andrea. But uh, in the middle, the idea of some earned income for events in the park, uh, for other aspects of park use that, for which we could you know, get income. Um, on the left, the idea of some public funding. And on the right, the idea of private funding, philanthropic, um, and otherwise, maybe a bid assessment as the development grows around the park, uh, an assessment on that development that would feed the park. It's important to note, so each of these, these are the kinds of funding that we will be strategizing for operations and maintenance, but it's important to note that some of them start out small and grow over time, and others start out more in the beginning and then diminish over time. For instance, the, the, the assessment on the development around the park will take a while to uh, reach its possible, its potential. So we look at a, a funding strategy that balances over time these different sources of income. Now one of the assets we have, one of the real great opportunities we have for uh, revenue generation in the park is big events. Uh, there's a real need, and everyone we've met with continues to verify this finding, that there's a real need for big events in downtown Oklahoma City. So uh, we see what there is available, and we see the kind of potential for events from 10 to 20,000 people that is really there as a demand. And it, it, this, this comparison shows how you compare to other cities of similar size, sizes and the kinds of events that they host in their parks. And you can see a very similarity at that sort of 20,000 number amongst a lot of your uh, peer cities. I think Austin is slightly unusual because of the South by Southwest event that happens there, so you get that huge number. And then <clears throat> the, the idea of the number of um, events that you might host in a year. You know, five probably makes sense. And we look to other cities and we look to examples um, to, to set the right number and the right level of use of the park. So we were also asked to think about how we might phase the park. Uh, as you know, the upper park will be first and the lower park will be built later um, per the sort of outline that was in the MAPS uh, sort of agenda. Uh, but within the upper park, there will be a phase one. And the idea of the phase one, which you see in this second diagram, is that uh, development of the park will happen along the boulevard and a connection to Skydance Bridge, because those two things really need, need to happen now. So that really is, is, is a phase, phase one approach. But we're looking at um, the, the, con the issues that affect that, one of which is utilities. There are a lot of utilities on the site. There are more than what you see here, but these are the major ones. And you can see they, they crisscross the site. So we're looking at being able to hopefully being a, working with uh, Johnson Associates, who are another major local partner of ours, looking at consolidating those utilities below grade into, into just a couple of corridors so that they're not everywhere on the site as much. And we're looking at the possibility of phase one including the event lawn. 
and the promontory so that there are immediately, we have the ability, immediately, 2014 or so, we have the ability to host big events at the site. So people begin to have a picture of the park in their minds. They start using it. They start coming. The buzz starts. Maybe there's food trucks, because there wouldn't be a cafe in phase one, but maybe there's food trucks. People begin to use the park. There would be a stage. So you'd have all the facilities for hosting big events. The boulevard gardens could be built in their final form. The corner plaza with the big interactive fountain, the big feature, would not be a part of phase one. That would come in phase two. But a connection along Robinson to Skydance Bridge could be permanently built in phase one. So we're looking at ways to get the best bang for our buck in an, in an initial phase one to get some energy and some events happening there and to help the surrounding development be a catalyst to the surrounding blocks in terms of development of those blocks. So you would see something like what you see here in color and what's in gray would be as it exists today. Um, that, that concludes our presentation. I think we mentioned last time, uh, and I want to mention again, that we are coordinating and working with the other initiatives that are happening around us. So the boulevard design, the transit design, the streetcar design, a route, the convention center uh, design and, and studies that they're doing now for that site, and the development planning that's happening for the blocks around us. We're all talking to each other. We're having, David has set up these great coordination meetings that have been very productive so that we're leveraging the efforts of each of these uh, MAPS initiatives. So love to answer questions or comments. All right, thank you, Mary Margaret. This is the part of the show where you get to participate. And we're going to open up the floor for questions, comments. And uh, Scott and I will have microphones. If you just raise your hand, we'll get to you individually. So if anybody has a question or comment, it might take me a while to get to you. Pardon me. Um, I'm Ian Fuller from IBC Gallery off of Broadway. Um, as coming to public art in the park, I was wondering, are we consulting with local sculptors and artists currently, or is this being um, consulted out of state? Do we know so far? Well, we're, we're just beginning. Part of our, so the answer is, is, is neither yet. Um, we're, we are tasked to develop a public art master plan. And that master plan will identify various opportunities. And I'm sure some of those opportunities will be local, and some of those opportunities uh, will be otherwise. But we'll be developing that as, a, as, a, as an overall strategy, some of which will be realized over time, some of which might be realized initially. We have been, when we were first hired a few years ago to, to develop the concept before the MAPS vote, we did collaborate with Jamie Carpenter on those light pieces. And so we are still bringing those forward. But that will just be one aspect of an overall uh, arts master plan. Um, that's great. Just so you know, uh, the art community is really pushing to be more involved with the uh, public art pieces that are going up around the city. So uh, there's a lot of support from the local art to really get involved with these changes. So great. Um, you have our support. So. That's great. And we met with Robbie today. And we'll be continuing to coordinate with her. And we totally agree with that. We also think it's really important that the art be as integral as possible and, and not just be sort of plopped. So that would be a mutual goal, I think. Thank you. Is it on? Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Um, I had sort of some small detailed things that I was wondering about. You talked about the cafe and the, the desire to make it sort of a very indoor outdoor space. And I come from sort of a blue collar background and I know in the summertime it can get really hot and dry and it's difficult to be outside. And what we do in a lot of blue collar environments is use evaporative cooling. And I wonder if there any thought had been given to using evaporative cooling for the outside space. And, uh, and I think know. that's a great idea. And in some of our parks, we have used misters, our falling water to help, but also, you know, green technology, evaporative cooling. I think Hans not. Yeah, evaporative cooling, that's... basically forcing air across yeah, falling exactly. water. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, it works pretty effectively. We did that for a park in, in Tucson. What's that? Um, right, in the yeah. hot, it, it, she pointed out when it's not humid. And sometimes we have that, but. The last two summers for sure have been very, very hot and dry. And when, it, and when the Oklahoma climate turns hot and dry, it can, 
can really provide some nice relief. Yeah, that's a good point. We're kind of praying for humidity lately, but uh, <laughs> I, and another detail I wondered about was I, I really love a lot of the designs. I like the interactive uh, fountain along the boulevard there where the kids can interact with that. I think it's really nice. I wondered about what I'm hearing you say is you're planning a splash park also by the lake. And I wondered if we might could incorporate that. It looks like to me by the plan, it's, you know, I suppose there'd be uh, positives to both ways, but you know, a lot of resorts anymore, you see an ocean resort, you see the ocean in the foreground, but the people are really interacting in water in a pool that merely looks at the other water. And so I wondered if, if it might be a nice opportunity to put the splash ground very near the lake. So you're looking at the water while the kids are interacting in the splash ground. So, um, it's pretty close now, but I think that's a good point. Yeah. 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 Good idea. People love to look at water, and they love to be in water. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it, on one of the slides, it had a, um, a figure there on the phase one budget. Uh, what's the overall budget, and at this time, are there any immediate concerns over the budget? Our overall budget for construction is $80 million. Our phase one budget you saw was over a little over eight eight million, um, and we're working within that budget. No, there's no immediate. I mean, we'd always love to have you. What you got some more? We'll take it. <laughs> um, no, we think uh, obviously the kind of park we're proposing uh, is the kind of park that can be uh, more bang for your buck than a park that's smaller. Because when you have a smaller park, it's all much more intense. When you have a larger park, you have these larger stretches of simple landscape. And it, it helps it be uh, you know, more budget conscious. So we're working within the budget. Hi. Hi, I had a question kind of on the uh, budget and water. The last few summers, we've had extreme droughts in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as sustainability for water, what are the concerns with this much greenery? Well, that's why we're proposing so little of it be lawn, be irrigated lawn. It's an it's a, it's a important balance. It's an important question, and it's an important balance that we make as we, as in all of our, almost all of our projects across the country, water resources becoming more and more of a critical issue. So where you really want people to use the landscape, to walk on it, to sit on it, to have big festivals on it, there's nothing like lawn. As in terms of being durable and taking that kind of use. So we're using lawn only where we want that to happen, play fields and the event lawn and a little bit around one side of the lake. The rest of the ground cover landscape is uh, a sort of native woodland ground cover landscape that will be very low water using. Um, and that's why, prairie gardens and then wetland gardens. Uh, and feeding the, feeding the lake itself and irrigation with Storm, captured stormwater and groundwater. And even the riparian gardens at the very lower park, uh, that can be circulated water from the river. So we're actually doing a job with those wetland gardens because they'll polish that water as it's circulated from the river and then put back into the river. It will be put back in, a better, in better shape than it, than it entered the system. So it's a very good point and something we're being very conscious of. Yes, I'm Sandy Webster with the Heartland Council of the Blind. I'm wondering about accessibility to disabled people to the park. You're talking about uh, trails for people on fast-moving bicycles. Will there be some kind of audible warning for those of us who can't see or any of the signs that you might have? And what about throughout the park, something that would help us find our way? Um, that's a really good point. Some of that is a level of detail we will, we will yet to get to, but some of it I, we have addressed right from the very beginning. And the most important way we address that right from the very beginning is that the majority of the park is flush in terms of grade. In fact, all of the park is flush in terms of grade. So there's no grade changes except the promontory. So the promontory is the hill at the back of the Great Lawn, and uh, that, that's the only, so there's no, no, there's no surprises in terms of, in terms of grade. Uh, in terms of the, the fast-moving bicycles, they would be on you know, specific designated, uh, pa not paths, but almost lanes. And yes, I think the auditory uh, announcement of those as different from the others is a very good idea. So uh, those are the kinds of details we'll want to work with uh, uh, with you are people who represent those issues as we go forward. 
Uh, could you expand on the connection to the river front park? Is it, um, what is that street that runs um, in between the river and the park look like? Will it, be, will it look any different, like the, the boulevard at the northern end? Or and what, the, what do those corners look like at Robinson? And is it a steep, once you get to that edge, is it a steep drop off to the riverbank? And what does that connection look like, I guess? That's a, that's a really good point. So we come to Southwest 15th Street. That's the extent of the MAPS downtown park study area. Um, we will definitely think about the relationship to the river, though. And we hope to be able to even expand our study a little bit uh, to, to look at the possibilities of connecting to the river itself. That's not yet been approved by city council, but we hope, it, we hope it might be so that we can do just a conceptual level study of the opportunities of bridging the, the gap that you just mentioned. Uh, this is the first meeting I've been to, so perhaps it's come up before. Um, has there ever been consideration when we've just walked in the myriad gardens as they are now, classical music, but like a European garden, some of them said, yeah. would be so welcome. That's an interesting idea. It's not something we've thought of yet or, or again, the level of detail we've gotten to. I know other parks as well, sometimes the public art in the park is audible. Um, there are parks sometimes where you go sit on a bench, and when you sit on the bench, you hear stories, the, the storytelling bench. So I think ideas of sound is a nice idea, and maybe it is part of the, the art master plan. I quit. My name's Mary Sosa with the College Hill Neighborhood Association in South Oklahoma City. And um, I was listening to you talk about the connections that are going to be all through the, the park what connection is there going to be to Perez Park? How, I, I heard you say that there would be a, um, a plaza, probably across the street or something, but is there going to be any more activity for uh, Perez Park other than we're here? <laughs> well, let me, a few things. Uh, let me start with the, the, with the street that is between Manuel Perez Park and the lower park. We would propose, if possible, that that street actually be paved like the plaza, so that the plaza sort of takes over the street, if you will, so that the connection is made quite strong. Um, then on the, in the lower park, in that plaza, a gazebo, and a gazebo for performances, for birthdays, family reunions, shade, uh, so that you could so that the activities of Manual Press could spill into the lower park. And then maybe as part of the public art, one of the things we've talked about is that maybe there are narrative stories in the park. And maybe one of those, as you're moving down the promenade in the lower park, maybe it says something in the paving, like this way to the river, this way to meet an American hero. Something that sort of you know, alerts one to the adjacency of Manual Press Park. Uh, another question on that is how much time and effort and money, we're spending close to $80 million to do all this. Uh, how much of that is going to go towards uh, Perez Park? Well, the MAPS three, the MAPS uh, boundary actually ends at Harvey. So we're actually within our project not able to take on Manual Press Park. But we've been meeting with uh, leaders of the Latino community and we've been meeting with the Parks Department. And we're, we're talking about having further meetings to talk about how Manual Press Park could take on its own sort of project. So it's a continued conversation. But it's not part of MAPS 3. But there, okay. that doesn't mean it can't happen in other ways. Okay. Could you comment on the linkages to the north, uh, the relationship of the park to the convention center and also to Myriad Gardens? Um, as part of this coordination with all these various other groups who are studying these various issues, we are beginning as a group to recommend some things about the boulevard, particularly within Hudson and Robinson. Our, our recommendation is to make that cross-section of the street as narrow as we possibly can 
and to make it feel more plaza-like than street-like, to really connect the convention center block, or two blocks, if you will, to our block or two blocks, and to have crossings at Hudson, Harvey, and Robinson, where it really you know, necks down and, and bulbs out so that that, that uh, connection is, is, very, is very tight. Um, the rest of the boulevard might be a have the wide planted median and, and be a sort of gracious wider thing, but we're thinking that maybe in those blocks between us, it becomes very intimate. And so cars slow down. They realize they're in a pedestrian environment, and they realize they've entered downtown. Those are just preliminary thoughts, and again, we're all still meeting as a group, and there are lots of voices and, that need to be heard and traffic engineering that needs to be done, but that's, that's where we're headed conceptually. Okay. Um, I represent the Oklahoma Health Equity Campaign, and I'm hoping that if, uh, if faced with a dilemma, and even if there isn't a dilemma, in some of the areas that you um, are trying to determine where to place things because of you know, there might be some uh, issues that, again, you just don't know which way to go. I hope that you will, the city will seriously consider doing a health impact assessment. Uh, again, with those areas that are more going to be more heavily densely populated with people during events, um, because again, we're looking at um, decreasing injuries, minimizing injuries, and other kinds of things that could be detrimental to their short-term and long-term um, health. Thank you. Good point. Over here. You have an area that um, was marked amusements, and since it can be so expensive to take a family to Bricktown, I wondered what you might have planned for families in that area, and specifically, would it include year-round um, or year-round activities for inclement weather? Um, we, we, in that area, we're specifically, at this point, referring to that's the place where you would rent the paddle boats to go on the lake. There would be concessions there as well, or at least, uh, you know, water and, you know, snow cones and whatever and, and bathrooms. Um, but that's not to say that in the future, um, there, of course, you've all heard a strong interest in the idea of a carousel. Maybe that's a place where one could be. That's not part of our project, but it's where one could be, and that, that could be housed um, to be interior. Um, beyond that, th there's the possibility, we think, in the future that the lake could accommodate a larger skating rink than there is in Myriad Gardens, if that proves to be, to be a demand. That's a possibility there as well. But those are future, future possibilities. Yeah, um, I'm sure I'm, for everybody, it's a great job. Well done. It's uh, pretty exciting to see all this happening Thank for you. us. But, um, and you've probably seen in your working uh, the rebirth of the Myriad Gardens, if you will. And I'm disappointed that it now, and especially in some of the graphics that we see, the Myriad Gardens is isolated. Uh, it's cut off from quarter shore. And um, so uh, what, my question can you help me feel better about that? <laughs> do you think there's anything that we can do to uh, influence the development maybe of the convention center that would uh, uh, keep a connection of the Myriad Gardens? And third, do you think it's even important that it uh, be connected at all? Well, starting with the third, absolutely. Um, and I think to answer the first two, um, we, that's why we're having these collaborative coordination sessions that include the, the firm that is tasked with looking at ways the convention center could inhabit that site. And they couldn't agree with you more. So um, I think in, in, there are different approaches to how the convention center could be built on that site, but in all of them, I think they feel very strongly, as do we, that that connection uh, is very important. At Hudson, at Robinson, possibly be even at Harvey as well. So generous wherever it is and, uh, and, and strong. I have a comment and a question, and my comment refers to whoever it was that spoke about uh, local artists and public art. I hope that you will consider using local uh, landscape companies when it comes time to plant. We like, like to have our money stay in the state. Um, and my question is, is it part of your brief at all, or is this 
the wrong person to ask. How much you think the maintenance will be on, on this? Uh, some kind of a rough estimate? That is part of our job. We're not there yet, but it is part of our job. So is, we, there, is there someone here from the city who would speak to the fact that that will be budgeted or how that will be handled? Uh, it's a concern to people. Yeah, it's absolutely. We, we don't like to design parks or build parks that don't have a plan, and part of our job is to develop a plan a series of recommended strategies for ways to fund that. So in your final um, presentation, there will be some firm figures? Yes. Thank you. Over here. My name is Victor Gonzalez. I'm the president of the Riverside Neighborhood Association. And I live at 312 Southwest 11. I received a letter a couple of years ago saying not to make any Mission repairs to my house because they might be taking it from us. At this time, uh, I know that Map 3 has been approved on this section from on the north side from Hudson to Robson, on the south side from Harvey to Robson. We're not included in it, so where do we stand? I'll turn to David. I can answer that, and my staff reminded me that I failed to introduce myself at the beginning. My name is David Todd, I'm the program manager for Maps. I'm with the city. Uh, currently, we, we have direction from city council that we are not to acquire land in the lower part till 2014. Um, we are acquiring land in the upper part. If, if you wish to sell, if, if you want to sell your property now, you can contact us and, and we can talk about those things, but we are not going to come talk to you as of yet, right now, until 2014. There, you, you may get a call sometime asking what I just asked is if you're interested, but we are not going to come and, and force you out, and we're not going to, to come and get your property. At least we're not authorized to talk to you until 2014. So that's, that's where you stand. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I work downtown, and I was wondering, um, the Married Gardens has different buildings they've built um, for cafes and stuff, and they're really modern, and they have been touched. Um, how is a new modern cafe gonna be utilized when we have um, two historic film row, or film exchange buildings that are the original ones that are, on, that are in the park land area? Um, I thought maybe restoring those would be a better fit for um, bringing context to the park as opposed to the, the modern architecture that at the Myriad Gardens isn't working. Um, you bring up really good points and something we have really paid a lot of attention to and given a lot of consideration to. And I'll answer, my answer actually answers both your questions. Um, there are things that we will make sure we do um, with the design of any kind of cafe. And it has to orient to the outside in a way that it can be seen so that people will come. It has to be sized. It has to be the right kind of rest cafe, so we think that means very informal. We think that means uh, not white tablecloth. Uh, we think that it's important to have operators on board before we finish designing it, not the other way around. Um, we did this in our park in Houston, Discovery Green, where the operators for the cafe came on board during design development so that they were part of making sure that it would work. We had made sure we had the market target right. All of those things are critical. Service has to work. All of those things are very critical to making uh, something like a cafe work in a park. For those very reasons, the existing building on the site, the Film Exchange Building, really was just in a wrong place to make a, a, a restaurant succeed or a cafe succeed. It was much bigger than a cafe needed to be, and the restoration costs of it would be really high. So it would need other uses besides just a cafe. Um, we couldn't find uses that made sense that would support a park that could take on such a restoration process. And it's, it's just in a, in a, not in a good place to be successful. The worst thing we could do is open a park and have a boarded up building in it. And that's where it looked like we were headed. So it just made much more sense to put those resources and that programming emphasis on Union Station, because Union Station is the jewel. And it's going to take all the program we can find and all the resources we can find to restore and make it a vibrant part of the park.
Hi, my name is Celia Moore, and um, one lady discussed the year-round possibility for the park, and um, my idea, as many people here have heard, but many of you have not, so I want to share it now, is indeed to have year-round facility so that the park is accessible to families for inexpensive entertainment and uh, bringing traffic to the downtown area every weekend, every week of the year. And the idea would be, for me, in the amusement center where there may be boat rentals, to make a multifunctional, multi-use building that would be compatible with the later development of the Union Station. Union Station being perhaps for weddings and, and galas and, you know, that white tablecloth occasion that everybody loves to have once in a while. But families, as a rule, like little birthday parties and, and more casual entertainment. So my idea is to build the OKC Carousel Corral. And it would be very unique in being the first Wild West carousel in the country, not only in the country um, from the standpoint, stand, standpoint of um, different painted types, but every pony would be telling and representing a story of historic importance to the city and the territory. There might be Soap Suds, which was Will Rogers' horse, Winnie Mae for Wiley Post, Prairie Dancer for Maria Tallchief and the ballerinas. So every single ride, including Surrey with a fringe on top, would be uniquely Oklahoma. And I think this park is headed to be uniquely Oklahoman, but we need something more than indigenous plants because every park in the country has to have indigenous plants to survive. But having a uniquely Oklahoman carousel, first one in the world, like it with headsets that you can plug into your brass pole and hear your pony tell the story of who, what you're riding and why it's important to the city. Additionally, if it's possible, the idea of a panoramic movie so as you're on your steed, you're riding along with stampeding buffaloes or you're riding along with cowboys roping them doggies. And a tradition to be built would be sunset every, every single evening. And it would be an Oklahoma beautiful sunset with the theme from Oklahoma played. So it might become a tradition to say, instead of high noon at the OK Corral, it'll be sundown at the OKC Corral. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> <clears throat> me again. <laughs> I'll go back to what the lady said back here. I'm concerned about the maintenance. As a longtime parks uh, employee, my concern is the maintenance of this humongous park. Uh, is the parks department going to be responsible for the maintenance of this park? Well, one of our other charges, I should have mentioned, besides identifying the, the maintenance program, and, and let me start with that, because it's not just maintenance, it's also operations. A park like this doesn't just need to be maintained, it needs programming, it needs administration, it needs somebody actively engaging possible programming in the park to bring people there. So we'll be identifying the needs, we'll be identifying the costs, and we'll be identifying the possible uh, funding uh, sources uh, for that. We will also be identifying possible governance structures, and we're working with Parks and Recreation, but it may not be maintained by Parks and Recreation. It may, there may be a conservancy, there may be a shared, there may be some things Parks and Rec does, and there may be some things that outside uh, contracted help does. It, it's, all that is yet to be determined, but it is our job to make recommendations for all of that, because it's important that there be a, a, a framework. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I like what you guys have got here so far. It looks interesting. Um, first time I've been to this meeting. But um, one of the things I haven't heard here, and I don't know if it's been mentioned in the other meetings, what about security and safety for the public and stuff? How is that going to be interacted? Is the city going to be in charge of it? Or is there going to be like a special organization that's going to secure the place and stuff? I mean, how's that going to be about? Is there going to be curfew time? 
you know, stuff like that. Um, That's exactly the same answer um, to, the, to the, the lady who just asked about maintenance and operations. We will also be developing uh, recommendations for security and who can best handle that as part of the governance structure of the park. Uh, but the very first thing we're doing is making sure we're designing a park that inherently has visual uh, surveillance possi you know, possibility so that there aren't places where it's easy to hide and where people will feel scared and, and afraid to go in. So, and it'll be well lit. You know? So in, design, in terms of design, we're doing those things. And then in terms of programming, we will develop that program. Mary Margaret, I wanted yep. to touch on a couple of things that have come up. One is the funding. Um, it's just a point of information. I, I don't know if many people would recognize it. I think most of us are aware that Central Park got a really bad reputation about 25 or 30 years ago. Central Park in New York City. Central Park in yep. New York City, yeah. And today, Central Park in New York City, even though there's how many millions of people around <clears throat> it and so much opportunity for bad, it's really shiny. Uh, you know, it, there's absolutely no graffiti, and there's absolutely, um, you know, it's just really a shining example. And what's really unique to me about that is to learn that it's not managed by the city. It is managed by a conservancy. And, uh, I mean, the city puts funding into it, as philanthropy does, and, and I, I think it's a great example that parks are often a place where city employees just don't tend to have that level of detail and passion for that area that it really takes to make it all work. And so I, um, and I'm not big on the city of Oklahoma City employee, it's just, it's just a common thing I think that we, we need to recognize. And I think is the sooner we as citizens, I mean, it's not something you're gonna be able to do for us. I think we as citizens are going to have to, to recognize that that's part of it. And the sooner we can form a group like that and, uh, and start looking for ways of caring for our park and not waiting for someone else to care for it, for us, uh, you know, the better off we're going to be. And um, so, anyway, I wanted to bring that up. There was a few small things I wanted to touch on too. This dear lady down here, I love her passion about this carousel. I mean, she has <laughs> just really got this passion about that. And, and I, I see you smiling, but I haven't really seen yet, maybe it's on there, but is there clearly at least a piece of ground identified with an arrow that says carousel? Well, it's cleverly coded within the word amusement. We think that's the right place for it. It's not within our, our budget to build it. Well, but, I know, but it doesn't cost very much to write carousel on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were trying to be more general because it might be other things, you know. But that's the place. I think she will raise the money. I don't I, I see there's little doubt to me that this woman's gonna get this done. But, uh, but I, I think it's important that you identify okay. on the piece of paper carousel. So okay. that she at least has attractive land and she and it helps her to build her expectation because if you, don't, if you don't write it on there. Okay, uh, I, I hear you. So anyway, there's my I hear you. He asked me if I have a question. I need that. <laughs> In the form of a question, my last question, you talked about a lake being used as perhaps an ice skating rink. And I, mm -hmm. I think that's exciting. I just wonder if you could speak technically to how would that work. Well, um, our park in Houston, Discovery Green Lake, has a smaller than this one. It's not big enough for paddle boats. It's uh, more like a pond, but part of that pond, part of that small lake, is set up so that every year they freeze it. And it's built with the infrastructure to allow that to happen. Um, and they ice skate on it. So it's very possible to do that. Uh, and to your first point, uh, I do want to note that Tim Marshall is the consultant on our team who will be helping us with the governance structure possibilities. And he worked for New York Central Park during that transition. So he brings a great wealth of knowledge. Yeah, well, he's one of our consultants. Yeah, he's on our team. Yeah, it's, e it's called ETM Associates. His name is Tim Marshall. So. I'm David Puente. I'm with uh, Perez Park, co-chairman of the committee to save the park. What we're talking about is funding, and you've made it clear that, you know, in your boundary, you have no money for Manuel Perez Park. But here tonight, we have city council members that it is your place to help us raise funding for parks department, city manager and people. We will be there asking for help because these people have realized the importance of a national hero 
Congressional Medal of Honor winner. And we appreciate you almost partnering with us, but you can't exactly. We appreciate you listening to us. We want to keep that important part of uh, our community forever. And um, so we want the council to know that we're going to come to you. We've been with uh, Wendell. We need help with uh, building this park more attractive to the community. And everything you've done with the whole park, um, we are satisfied. We appreciate it. And, um, you know, we couldn't ask for anything more. So just keep the, keep the memory of Manuel Perez Park because he is our local hero. It doesn't matter what nationality was. He's a military hero for the people of Oklahoma. Perhaps that's a great final note. <laughs> Anything else? We really appreciate all your input. We really do. This has been a great process. and This isn't the final product yet, but this is where we've gotten because of you guys and, and the other people who've, who've voiced their opinions. So let's give Mary Margaret a hand. For it.